Touche is this very relatively small island, it, it, several hectares is all, um, on the, off the tip of Cape Flattery. So it's just at the entrance of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And uh, as such, it's the first thing water hits basically when it's coming from Japan. The island itself has restricted access. Uh, it's owned by the Macaw tribe, who give us permission to work there, and, um, and it's rarely visited by other people. My research life is a little bit schizophrenic, right? We spend this time out on this remote island and, and the surrounding sites that are very rural. Um, we don't have many colleagues around at all. We have our, our students that are, are a great source of, of intellectual stimulation. But, uh, and then we have this other side where we come back to campus and there's many seminars and many people to interact with. And um, I think it's, a, it's been a good combination. My spouse is my closest colleague here on campus um, because we do have so many uh, um, you know, similar research questions and similar interests and we're working in the same area. Some of our recent work we've um, been involved in a project that we're both interested in this work with small population sizes and extinction which ties into individual variation that Kathy's interested in extinctions that um, I'm interested in. Tatouche is an ideal site um, because it's in a fairly remote and rather nasty stretch of water and that means that um, it's not very strongly impacted by humans and we can get a sense of a uh, more natural setting and how a natural system operates. Additionally, when we're doing uh, research work, um, it's often very challenging for ecologists to find places to work that the general public doesn't come in and mess up experiments, for instance, come in and harvest mussels from the shoreline. Tatouche is also remarkably diverse biologically, and so just as a biologist, it's a very exciting place to be, to see whales and birds of prey and uh, all sorts of colorful invertebrates and wild-shaped algae living on the shore and trying to figure out how they interact. One of the characteristics of many organisms, and particularly aquatic organisms, is that they can, individuals of the same size, or rather the same age, can vary greatly in size, and they can have very different fates. So that if we go out and even look at individuals who are the same age, there's immense variation in the experiences they, they've had and their likely fate in the future. As a consequence of how this affects reproduction, you can end up with relatively few individuals in a population that are contributing disproportionately to the next generation. You can have a small individual um, that might be quite old versus a large individual that might be quite young because it got the resources it needed early on and is gonna um, um, be very important to the persistence of the population in the future. We know that there are different processes that can contribute to extinction. Um, and in the past, understanding the role of both these processes was mostly a theoretical exercise. But we've been able to explore this question much more empirically by using um, uh, recent genetic techniques. We have a species that we're working with out on Tatouche Island, where we can um, try to disentangle the effects of demographics, um, that is just the size of the population, from genetic effects, that is whether or not inbreeding's been taking place or whether or not drift, genetic drift might be important. This is a, a kelp species, it's um, relatively common, it's characterized by uh, spores that don't disperse very far, and we're using uh, a method um, developed by others to basically plant our own populations and we can make small populations that have been established by single founders and therefore will be very inbred through time. We can manipulate the population size to understand the effect of population size and uh, we can follow what's going on as a function of their how they started genetically. That works in progress, but it's a, it's a way for us to ask in the field, that is in the, in the context, the, the real world, where this organism lives, uh, what the relative roles of demography and um, genetics are to the fate of these populations. Basically, there are three ways that uh, species uh, become extinct. One is, uh, through the effects of overexploitation by um, humans in the system. 
A second way would be uh, effects of global change or human activities which affect habitat, um, usually destroying habitat for species. A third is that species compositions change over time. There's actually a very large web of interdependencies of species interactions. And so if one species is effect, um, goes extinct, this in turn influences other species and they in turn can influence further species. So there's sort of a cascading effect that can influence other species and maybe even wrap around and affect humans. There's sort of a, a dual strategy that uh, I take in terms of trying to deal with extinctions. One is to do some basic field experiments to ask what happens, at least in a local area, if you remove a species from a system. So you can set up things like cages to keep birds from feeding in some areas and not others, or manipulate the presence or absence of fish in enclosures and so forth. Um, and that allows us to gain some insight experimentally into what extinctions do. Once we do this and we start figuring out how complex the responses are, we are left with the challenge of trying to figure out how to predict such complex responses. The problem with that is that very complex models that are needed to address uh, natural ecosystems uh, can predict just about anything if you put the right numbers into them. So the real challenge that I'm trying to grapple with is how you bring um, information from natural systems to constrain the behavior of models and make helpful predictions. Mathematical models are useful and if one of our charges in ecology is to help predict and guide applied questions then we need to become more facile in linking mathematical models to um, empirical information. It's a lot easier to just focus on a single species and avoid all the complexity. Conservationists in general feel like they don't have the sort of time uh, luxury in order to investigate conservation issues from a whole system perspective. This has the uh, disadvantage though potentially of missing some important interactions or really understanding why species are declining and in some cases uh, this can lead possibly to management that maybe is not as effective as thinking about the whole system.